Hi, my name's Louise Nell, and I'm the CEO of Easy Time Executive Search based in the UK. I have over 30 years of experience in global recruitment, and today we are um, presenting the global mobility, immigration, and business travel, the myths and reality. And I have three experts who are part of my panel. I have Judah Ronslow Cole, who is a partner that specializes in global government, strategy, and compliance at Fragments. She divides her time between London and Dubai. Julia supports clients worldwide to optimize global mobility strategies, enhance compliance, and leverage best practice in all critical immigration-related policies, including crisis management. In addition, Julia advises private clients on complex international migration solutions. Before joining Fragman, Julia was a partner, legal market leader, and head of global immigrations for PwC. Julia also formally advises to the Home Office in the UK on business investment and growth and represented business in the UK, Prime Minister's immigration stock take meetings. My second, uh, and I do apologise, people may not be able to see me, um, but hopefully you can hear me. My second um, panellist is Avron Goldberg. He is the Senior Vice President of Global Client Services for Wykirk Workforce Mobility. He has 30 years of strategic global mobility leadership experience, helping multinational companies navigate the increasingly complex and diverse global mobile workplace market. Avran has served as an architect of several groundbreaking research reports. Having lived and worked in South Africa and Europe, he currently lives in Hong Kong. He has won an array of prestigious awards in global mobility, including the Worldwide Employee Relocation's Highest Honour, the President's Award. And my third and final panellist is Wendy Maynard. She's an experienced global mobility director with significant knowledge of the profession and proven record for over 20 years. She is well versed and working with developing multicultural teams and creating a successful, respected global mobility function. Currently leading the global mobility function at the Intercontinental Hotel Group, a FTSE 100 hospitality company. Wendy has extensive experience in dealing with unusual and complex international moves. Wendy is very much aware that today's world brings extraordinary challenges in moving employees internationally for ensuring the business maintains compliance with numerous ever-changing regulations to making sure employees arrive safe and well. Oh, I think we might have lost um, lost our hostess. So um, perhaps we should just carry on and um, we should just talk about the first question that we were going to discuss, um, which is about business travel. So I think, you know, that we've had a really good um, session of discussing these uh, hot topics um, in the lead up to today. And I was going to start um, by talking about what I thought was the future of business travel and then hand over um, to uh, Wendy and Avron for their views. So I believe that business travel um, will pick up. And what we're seeing by our clients is a, a real demand for business travel in that the drivers for business travel haven't changed. But although there is this real pent up demand to travel, and I'm very interested to hear what Wendy's got to say, particularly uh, about the leisure industry, um, there are some real difficulties about business travel. And I think the days of those trips, which you sort of combine a meeting on a Friday with a lovely weekend in Paris have gone. And one of the things I think are particularly funny about um, the nomenclature during the pandemic is suddenly we have this this new new dictionary of words, and I've heard so much about pleasure trips and vanity travel. So I I do think they're probably two things that are really uh, very low down on priorities of companies going forward. 
But also, I think companies are rather used to having um, the money that they've saved through the travel budget. And while companies are coming out of the pandemic and still suffering some economic impact, um, what I think you will see is that um, companies don't really want to spend that travel budget unless it's really a very, very important travel. And the other thing I've seen is sustainability, because we've seen that sustainability is really on every company's agenda. And we know international travel is, is actually responsible for a, a substantial percentage of the world's carbon emissions. And I, I see there's a great pressure on boards to prioritize sustainability. And also uh, that is affecting the travel budget. Although I did think it was quite funny yesterday, there was a very interesting report about the use of private planes and how that has actually really accelerated um, during the pandemic. So also there's a lot of discussion about vaccine passports, um, which will you know, make it easier for travel. And the G7, which is meeting now, um, has talked about having mutual recognition of vaccine passports to help global travel. But then some countries and ministers from India, for example, are, are not so happy with that uniformity because they feel that it's actually quite discriminatory from for their nation's perspective. But I think we will come towards an agreed um, standard for COVID-19 uh, certificates. So I think in summary, what, what I, I believe about business travel is that you will see it really rebound, um, but there are you know, these numbers of, of, of quite significant challenges. Wendy, I'm sorry, everybody. My camera and, and Wi-Fi seems to be disconnected, so I can only apologise. Um, so I'm very sorry I, I couldn't be part of that first uh, introduction. But Wendy, what, what are your thoughts on what um, Julia had to say? No, um, most of what Julia has to say, I would definitely agree with. Um, if we actually look at business travel during the pandemic period, obviously it has significantly reduced. Um, but there has still been travel going on. It hasn't actually uh, completely finished. Um, so we've seen uh, repatriations, which is obviously quite natural. But what we've also seen are um, moves probably moving people internationally that are going to be going there for say two three years so sort of like a midterm secondment normally business critical where they can't actually wait um going forward to the future we know that things aren't going to go back as a cliff edge we know that there are still going to be restrictions in place for a little while longer um, it is going to make business travel far more complex it has done in the pandemic and i can see that happening um, in the future as well. Logistics is a bit of a nightmare. One thing that we really do need to sort out is definitely around the vaccine. Understanding um, exactly what tests are required. Um, if we could have some form of global consistency, that would be great um, because we know there's an awful lot of confusion around that at the moment. Even people going on holiday are getting caught out and being rejected from the aircraft because they haven't got the right piece of paper in front of them. The other thing also, I think, with business travel, an area that perhaps companies need to be a little bit more mindful about is obviously anything around healthcare. This is something that has obviously been um, on the top of people, companies' agendas during the pandemic, um, not just for expats, but for locals as well. But for the expats, there's always been some kind of magic with an international healthcare policy so that if somebody, for example, did become ill, worst case scenario is that you could ship them back to their home country or to a country nearby for them to get the support and treatment that they needed. Obviously, during the pandemic, that did not happen. And I think that that's definitely called into question for some companies, um, the scope of their healthcare and whether it goes far enough to support people um, in terms of crisis. Um, I would definitely agree with Julia about travel budgets. Um, I think a lot of companies, our countries have to go through economic recovery. Uh, Organisations will have to go through the same process. Um, they have become used to having a much more lighter travel budget. I think what companies need to have a look at and a real good think about, though, is the cost compared to the efficiency of running global projects um, or moving people overseas, because it's it's more tricky doing that virtually. Aaron? I mean, tracking Excellent technology. Point. Yeah, I was going to say tracking technology for, for business travel. 
Absolutely. So, uh, excellent points made by both Julia and and and, and Wendy in in, in in this in this regard. Personally, I foresee ultimately what you know for me the one of the key uh, uh, changes in the future would be that expect greater rigor in pre-travel authorization to travel and a focus on assessment and tracking technology, which is basically rapidly becoming the norm for business travel through the pandemic. Um, as an example, given the importance of of, of, of this very uh, need. We had wide up uh, recently developed a groundbreaking technology solution, which is uh, known as Smart Trip. The Wicked Smart Trip uh, actually allows companies uh, to better manage what we call fluid workforce, which could be assignees, transferees, or indeed even remote workers, with greater transparency and efficiency uh, and mitigating associated tax fees and immigration risks. The tool is built on technology that pre-assesses each trip uh, against the latest travel tax and immigration regulations worldwide and then actually alerts designated and dedicated specialists to identify and address any resulting uh, compliance issues which are actually flagged by the pre by this pre pre assessment before they actually become problems so that ability to know before you go is critical to making the right decisions or helping make the right decisions at the right time when it comes to any company's mobile talent and to avoiding things like penalties restrictions and reputational damage that compliance violations can bring uh, the Smart Trip tool is also a powerful global talent management tool in that it it's, uh, supports a strengthened corporate duty of care by actually enabling client HR or security teams to be able to locate and communicate directly with their employees in the event of an emergency or get them safely, you know, to safety where necessary. Ultimately, whereas the pre-pandemic, the single biggest approval-related consideration, remember those heady days? The single biggest approval-related consideration was most often just obtaining budgetary and necessary line management approval to travel. Uh, unless you were going somewhere known to be particularly high risk, such as a handful of locations in either Africa, Asia, or the Middle East, uh, I believe that going forward, we, are, you know, we can expect to see a lasting triangulation of company-defined and applied risk assessments, risk mitigation, and duty of care framework as one point of a triangle, the triangle, along with a more rigorous compliance framework as the second point of the triangle to accompany any kind or any and all kinds of uh, business travel whose third point in the triangle will be that traditional established budgetary and line management approval required for business travel. Any further? Oh, I've gone again. I can only apologize, guys. <laughs> you can uh, you know, hear me. That's but... okay. We can, we can hear you, but we can't see you. So oh, you, can you can't see the you, 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 you can continue leading us. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. I mean, I there, was, there was a recent McKenzie survey, actually, and they estimated about 20% of business tra travel may not return after the pandemic. Uh, and, and that um, I say that... Uh, I mean, I, I've done a, a recent survey, a pulse survey, uh, which was really interesting. And, um, and one of the questions was, you know, what, what is the most important reason for business um, travel post lockdown? And, uh, and most of 60 uh, percent have actually said it's meeting external business clients, followed by building up that relationship again. So it's very interesting, um, you know, the way this is um, kind of going and and that um i think the, you know the pandemic is here to stay and and we just have to find better solutions for business travel um but going on to our i mean we're very conscious on we've got three really good questions and my second question to the panel and hopefully i'll i will revert back soon visually but what is the impact of the pandemic on the established drivers for global mobility and avra and i, I kind of direct this to you first of all followed by wendy and julia Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Look, the established drivers for global mobility, in my view, have been in place pretty much since the inception of global mobility with one fairly recent addition. The foundational drivers include uh, knowledge and technology transfer, company culture transfer, uh, filling talent gaps or shortages, uh, talent or leadership development, the opening or developing of new markets and project related needs. Now, the most recent addition to that set that you know that set of established uh, drivers, which I which I just mentioned, um, is employee initiated moves propelled largely by younger generational em uh, uh, employees. And I'm, I know Wendy has you know has views on that phenomenon that she's going to share with us. In my view, none of these drivers, none of them, are going to change post COVID when we come out of COVID. 
the uh -huh. um, changes in the way changes in the way we work will certainly yep. impact some forms of assignment, and they'll and, and they'll undoubtedly impact. Uh, the way in which uh, um, a, a, some, assign, uh, some assignments are approached to a certain degree, but whether you are for it or against it, I just think that the the you know the the, the phenomenon and the fact of globalization and the fact of an interconnected global economy is here to stay. We might well see shifts in typical geographic patterns for global mobility um, occasioned by some of the things that have been going on as a result or even during the pandemic. And I'd like to pull out one example, just perhaps selfishly from an APAC point of view. Um, in, November 20, in November 2020, largely unnoticed and hu hugely overshadowed, perhaps, by the pandemic, the world's largest free trade agreement was actually signed. And I don't think very few people actually even noticed this. The, you know, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the RCEP, was signed after eight years of delibera deliberation in Asia. And it's a an hugely significant um, 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 free trade deal because it actually brings together um, um, uh, China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and the 10 ASEAN countries for the first time. The bloc fully represents very close to 30% of global GDP. And this RCEP's stated purpose and intent and very reason for being called into life is to support economic recovery, to promote inclusive development, to promote job creation, to strengthen regional supply chains. So this new trade agreement is expected to foster much stronger intra-regional growth within APAC and subsequently higher mobility volumes across the region. It's also expected to spur much stronger intra-country activity within APAC as manufacturing and distribution expands in the region. So that's just one example of I think how we, you know, during the pandemic, overshadowed by the pandemic, largely unnoticed something hugely significant has actually happened at, you know, at the level of global free trade that is going to have a very significant effect on global mobility post-pandemic. Wendy. Um, so I would definitely agree with everyone that the established drivers are still here to remain. Um, as much as we would love to have some form of disruptive event to actually really challenge us um, on those, I think this disruptive event has been so unpredictable, it's not the right time to do so. So it might be something that we look at it later on in a couple of years' time, but certainly for now they're here to stay. But to just go back on something that Afron said was the employee-initiated moves. Mm -hmm. At the start of the pandemic, we uh, a lot of companies saw employees either ask or just do it and basically move back home. Some move to other countries, but most of them actually move back home to be with their, their families <coughs> at the time where obviously there was significant um, unpredictability and stress. And at that point in time, I'm sure most companies thought that was the right thing to do for, for well-being. But as we know, the pandemic has moved on and has stayed with us for a lot more, a uh, longer period of time than we actually thought. And although governments have put certain concessions in place for uh, tax and immigration, um, there is still um, a lot of non-compliance now that is going on that companies are going to have to pick up. Um, and for some companies that have low, allowed many employees to do that, there is actually a sense of chaos. So we're not just talking about individuals now not losing the right for them to go back to, uh, to work in their contracted com country. We're actually talking about tax uh, implications, so security implications, um, employment law. We're talking about individuals now sitting with colleagues on significantly higher packages than uh, their colleagues are actually getting. And there could also be some issues around mandatory benefits not being provided to them. Um, Employee-initiated moves are still likely to be on the agenda when people actually look at their uh, future work policies because they are very popular with young generation. But I think what needs to happen with companies is that they need to have uh, be much more disciplined and a lot more control um, around uh, the validation or whether it's practically possible for these moves to go ahead. There are some toxic combination of uh, country moves that can create a significant issue uh, for the individual and for the company as well. Um, the companies also need to understand that it can create um, more cost as well. And um, where is that cost going to be picked up? Is it going to be the employee or is it going to be the company itself or are they going to share it? 
So I think there's a lot of thought for uh, companies to think about this if they are going to continue with employee initiated groups. I've, I've got quite a few questions, actually, um, Wendy. Um, <clears throat> so in the early days, you've actually had to bring back your assignees. Now, were they were working remotely in their host, in, sorry, in their home country, or did you have to backfill that space? I mean, where did you find that talent? I mean, did your business or your projects get delayed? I know, you know, this is, I mean, I, I work and, 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 you know, provide talent for people all over the world, but how did, you know, you're in hospitality, how did you solve the problem of, that individual leaving one country, going back to their home country, and did you know? Did they actually pick up that actual role working from their own home and understanding, of course, the implication of tax and um, and other compliance issues that you you would have? That's a very good question. So most of us are actually used to having global teams, and we've been used to that for a very long period of time. So the pandemic in having uh, employees, perhaps. Uh, living and working in another country to us hasn't been such an issue. Bizarrely, because we have been tracking who is where and the displaced colleagues that have obviously wandered off and put themselves somewhere else, we actually haven't had very many of them at all compared to other companies. Um, not too sure what the reason behind that is. Um, so I would say we're, we're not actually a really good example of uh, solving issues because we didn't actually have many. But I am aware that there have been companies out there that have struggled um, with the pandemic um, projects. I mean, we don't do a huge amount of project work, but I do know that companies where most of their expats are based on project work, mm -hmm. um, they've had to delay projects. And I think it's got to a point where they've had to delay them, then they need to be thinking about how can we put them in place. But logistically, it, that is a nightmare because with restrictions coming in and going very quickly, even repatriating people with uh, planes keep being cancelled. You know, we had an individual try to repatriate somebody um, and their plane get kept being cancelled. They were actually delayed by three months. By then, their visas had run out. They were in a country that didn't have any concessional treatment, so they had to go and get their new visas. They weren't allowed to leave the country until they got their new visas. Um, and it delayed that another month. So yeah. I, yeah, I'm probably not the right person to talk about the complexity, but I know there are a lot of heads of mobility where it's been an enormously stressful time for them trying to, to sort out everything that's been going on. Wow. There have been, like, been a lot of nightmarish scenarios that unfolded, as you, know, as, as you alluded to, Wendy. Ju Julia, is, is it not true to say that, particularly to the original question, which was around what happened when companies did actually managed to repatriate because a lot of people actually got stuck. Companies mm -hmm. tried to bring people back in the early stages of the pandemic, but they couldn't. So they stayed, yeah. they sheltered in place, right? Yeah. But for those companies that actually managed to get people out and bring them back home, mm -hmm. particularly from a, I think from a, from an, from an EU perspective, is it not true to say that quite a, quite a few governments actually responded quite quickly and quite positively in giving, you know, in, 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 in giving breaks to and treating and, you know, you're creating special circumstances where people, you know, were not going to get too tangled up in the, you know, in in this in the scenario from a from a tax and compliance point of view. Yes, I mean, you did see um, a proliferation of concessions across the world, which are, you know, now coming to an end or have ended, which in itself is causing own problems. But right. then you very severe situations where, for example, India introduced a ban on its own citizens coming back to India. And at that point, there were a lot of Indian citizens who were actually en route back to India, stopping off, for example, in, in Indonesia. And there were situations where there were a lot of people at the airport who were not allowed into the country that they were in the airport of and couldn't go back to India. Um, I dealt with one situation where there was uh, a lady who was running a factory in Japan and she had her husband and three young children in the UK and she didn't actually uh, manage to get reunited with them for uh, several months. So I think to Wendy's point, you know, there, there um, you know, has been extremely difficult. And also to Wendy's point, I so agree about the, the compliance issues that we have with the remote working scenarios. But I did want to just raise one point.
point to the original question, which is about the drivers for um, yep. mobility. And that is that if you actually look and stand back at the world and, and you look at what's going on, you can see why there are such uh, established drivers for mobility. And in particular, Brexit has caused companies in the UK to think outside of the EU. And there's a lot of interest. I'm the board of the London Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and I've noticed there's lots of interest in sort of smaller companies to travel, for example, to the Expo in Dubai to explore the opportunities um, in the Middle East. Um, I've been involved in some of the very big projects in Saudi Arabia, and uh, they are obviously attracting huge numbers of companies um, on these projects like um, the Red Sea Development, Neon, um, and, you know, there's a huge demand for companies globally to, to go to uh, Saudi and also just generally in the Middle East. And then um, this morning I was on a call with my colleague, uh, Becky, in, in China, and she was saying that there's a lot of movement now in and out of China, and particularly Germany to China, um, a lot of car manufacturers going into China, uh, China to the US. So I think, you know, if anything, you know, there's more uh, need for companies to search and, and get strength to their bottom line as they rebound from the um, economic fallout of the pandemic, and all of this will will be, you know, driving mobility. Wow. Okay. So um, <clears throat> my third um, question, and it's going to be quite a lengthy question and, and debate, but it's what is the impact of the pandemic on mobility types, and what needs to be prioritised? And this is a massive subject. You know, we've got different types of communication platforms, how people work, um, how to um, lead a virtual uh, workforce, the various different types of assignments and the risks and compliance that's got to be in place. Um, Avron, sorry, Wendy, I'd like to, to direct this to you first. Over to you and, and, and let's see what, you know, your, your thoughts are and, 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 you know, how you're getting on um, forward thinking. No, that's fine. Thank you. So because we've got the established drivers, mostly staying uh, the same, not really an introduction of uh, any other drivers, um, the mobility types are likely to stay as they are, but it is probably that there's going to be more support required or different support to what we're normally used to. Um, so as uh, Julia had mentioned, um, we I have personally seen some... Um, horrendous things happening during the pandemic were right at the very early stages for all the right reasons. You know, we had employees moving their families back home where they thought they would be safer and themselves staying in the host country. And then when there's a combination of one country not allowing people to leave and another country not allowing people to arrive, those families were had in full separation for eight, nine, ten months. Um, so that obviously created huge issues. If you're a foreign national as well, I mean, we've all had a hard time, but if it's a foreign national, being so far away from your family has obviously taken its toll. Um, so with that in mind, so the, the couple of other things that have probably cropped up um, whilst we've been in the pandemic, and again, probably need to be looked at as a priority, is a lot of children obviously had to get used to virtual schooling um, so um, international schools are, are very, very expensive and there are a number of parents that basically felt that they were entitled to a refund because they didn't think they were getting their money's worth. Um, but whereas the school's point of view was that they were still putting in the work um, and obviously it wasn't, it wasn't their initiation to actually go back to, to virtual schooling. Um, so I think that, that I think, parents are probably going to be more astute not about the fact that fantastic i'm now getting private schooling paid for by the company but actually looking at um what that school is actually going to be able to provide for their children the type of schooling that they're going to be getting and the quality of schooling as well um obviously i've talked about healthcare policies um 
most companies though have recognized that this has been a very stressful time for their employees and what they've done is they've put online platforms in place and employee assistance programs as well i would question whether that is sufficient actually for a population that is so distant uh from their home country um we also have to remember that all these type of support is employee initiated you have to be in the frame of mind to recognize you've got a problem um, to actually go on and get that support. Um, for the worst cases, actually, you're disengaged, so you probably won't reach out for help anyway. Um, so there's long been the thought that when you move people from one country to another country, there's some form of cultural training on board to onboard them. I actually, and we've long known there's a, a cycle of emotions when you move somebody to an overseas country as well. Um, I think we need to build on that side of emotions and actually provide far more, I think, sort of mental health support as we move people around the world globally. <clears throat> I mean, there, there's so many different. I mean, I, I explained just before we started that, you know, I, I'm recruiting people on a remote, you know, on a virtual basis. And there's a lot of people who are actually being um, and same with exp expats, you know, being um, onboarded virtually. And it's tough culturally to try and help them engage with um, the, you know, the, the team and, the, you know, the challenges and, and let alone all the other the risks and compliances they've all got to tick. Um, but with you, Avron, and same with you, Julia, um, now, you're both professionals within your own right in, in mobility and providing services. But have you found it very hard when you take on staff? I know you, you don't do that so much, Julia, but I know you have, Ron. But, you know, how are you trying to onboard your own staff and let alone advise um, your clients, your corporates in, you know, advising them on the different mobility types? And, and when you relocate the, the, the expats, how are you finding, you know, how are you advising them? Are you putting something in place? Oh, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> onboarding, um, I guess we've been in a fortunate position where, um, yes, we have onboarded virtually. I think we've you know, uh, faced the same challenges that any organization has challenged, uh, you know, has, um, has faced. I think luckily, you know, we do have a very strong uh, uh, <clears throat> training um, discipline within the company, um, so that a fair amount of our training was already um, um, on file, as it were, and recorded. And so we virtualized very quickly whatever you know, whatever parts of our training were not already uh, in a digital or or virtual format. Um, so we were very quickly able to um, plug that gap, as it were. Um, I think Wycott in particular, Wycott in particular, is is also very fortunate to. I think we're probably the only RMC that actually has an, a, a, a talent management, an executive vice president of talent management. So we actually have a executive level leader that actually directs um, the, you know, our entire talent management uh, strategy and framework uh, enterprise wide. Um, so um, he was a, you know, he was able to harness all the necessary resources both within and outside the organization in order to optimize, um, you know. Um, onboarding in a virtual context for clients we don't you know i'm not sure uh, perhaps julia's got some perspective on that i mean you know onboarding for clients we don't get involved in that so much right so uh louise i'm not sure i'm not sure what the question was you know i don't with, really have much yeah i was going to say much. with you julia you know you talk about remote working schemes you know across the globe um tax and immigration and employment laws. I mean, you know, with, with onboarding people remotely and maybe not in the actual country that they should be, you know, it, it's looking at the immigration and the risk and the tax. Yeah. I mean, I think this is a big, big issue for companies. And um, I think what we're seeing is um, a lot of uh, moves are either you know self-promoted so people would like to 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 make those moves um what we're seeing unfortunately is that the regulatory framework isn't there to support it you know we're seeing gradual huge changes in the way immigration law is across the world to try and support these new ideas um and the future of work 
but but you know the regulatory framework isn't quite there so i think that people not just only have you know the the issues that they have with perhaps onboarding with a new employer or settling in and working remotely but they also are very mindful of all of the different compliance issues that they are facing and i think that we're seeing a seismic change around the world about you know the, what's needed in terms of a workforce i mean oh. close to the middle east what you're seeing is that uh, there's a real recognition that the very kind of low skilled uh, mobility that you are seeing from countries like the philippines and egypt into um countries like the uae and saudi um to to work on construction sites or in households we're seeing that you know there's been um Ab- the abu dhabi dialogues uh, just last week where they were looking at how to um skill up this workforce because actually they needed to do slightly m- more uh higher skilled things in the future mm-hmm. so how are you going to deal with that and then we've seen as a result of the pandemic from the cases that you know wendy's been describing that people are very uh concerned about not getting permanent residence or even citizenship in countries and so for example in the UAE now you can uh there is a, a, a highly discretionary scheme which for people that are really adding something back to the country but there is a sort of citizenship uh pathway and we're seeing a proliferation of you know golden visas and citizenship by investment that are, are really attracting people's attention and of course all these uh, remote working schemes um and you know i think that this is it's just a very very complicated landscape and you know back to your original question louise it it's oh. just an added complexity that people have to think about now for for the future interesting if i may what i'd like to add you know i mean the question being what is the impact of the pandemic on mobility types and what i'd like to say is that several of the clients that i have been speaking to uh, <clears throat> have expressed the view that the the there and back or out you know out and back assignments are 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 going to uh, enjoy a surge in popularity you know regain popularity over the over the move type of permanent one way moves i think as many of us know permanent one way moves was that you know in, in in recent years have actually made substantial gains as the preferred move type in global mobility however uh, you know clearly in the aftermath of the pandemic uh, many prospective assignees are likely certainly in the early stages um, of, you know of of that period that we can properly call post pandemic um many prospective assignees are likely to balk at the idea of you know one way tickets to a new country especially where where families involved the other most talked about mobility type in a covid and a post covid context really is virtual assign- virtual assignments um and when i say talked about uh, yeah talk is mostly where it's at um at the moment in any event as as companies realize that come to a a a realization as upon closer examination that there are reams of work to be done on clarifying both the efficacy and applicability of virtual assignments complex tax compliance immigration and permanent establishment considerations all come into play with virtual assignments not to mention just the overall question of the the, the value of an assignment type which involves the assignee not actually and not actually being located in the country or region to which they are being you know they have been assigned in any event there's no real evidence yet that companies will seek substantially to replace their mobile populations with virtual assignees regardless of um you know um their 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 current approaches the most comprehensive survey on the subject today was published by PwC in December 2020 um and 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 that survey of over 300 global com- you know companies worldwide showed that you know showed that amongst the majority of respondents um whilst whilst that majority were considering virtual assignments equally so the majority of respondents expected no more than 10% of their mobile population in the future to ever be replaced by virtual assignments so um as i on record as having said before rather than virtual assignments i think you know i foresee that the impact of the pandemic on that particular mobility new mobility type will be on the development or emergence of a hybrid assignment type um in other words um an assignment where the assignee is indeed indeed remote based but will but remote based with a structured 
regime of frequent or extended business travel into the location or region that they are ultimately responsible for. Wendy, <clears throat> with um, with what um, Avron? Sorry, I'm blacked out again. Uh, with what Avron has uh, just responded to, you know, to that question, how how's how's your business related? I mean, are, are you? Um, Having a lot of your, I know you know a lot of your signees, uh, you know, wanting to be nearer to their families. But have you noticed there's a slight change that there's, you know, a lot more remote um, assign assignments, more maybe project based. I know you're in hospitality, but ha have you? It, it can see that you know there's a trend there. I was going to say uh, having a, site, uh, a a virtual general manager on assignment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be quite difficult. Um, so no, as a company, we're not seeing that. We're not really seeing uh, virtual assignments taken off at this moment in time. Generally, uh, speaking to other heads off as well, that's not really something that's on our agenda at the moment, if I'm honest. It's more about the displaced people that are, are more of a concern. Um, it, it might be something that comes out in the future. Mm -hmm. if are concerned about their travel budgets as well. Um, it might be something that they see as businesses see, but I would in, but I would agree with some of the comments that Avron has made. It's yeah. not ideal. It's really it's really not ideal. The whole point of you looking at a someone going on assignment for their own development, how can you possibly do that virtually? It that's yeah. not really the way it works. Um, I do get a general sense that there's just a whole lot of business trips stacking up, ready for the takeoff to go back. <laughs> Exactly the same um, with holidays as well. I think the first people are just sitting and waiting. Um, until lots more work. Lots more work for Julie and colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I will see. While once, once it becomes a bit more predictable, it's the unpredictability of everything at this moment in time which is just stopping people. Mm. I think when things become a little bit more organised, a little bit more predictable, we will see. I think a surge of things happening and then I hopefully it will quieten down again. It, it would be it would be disappointing if we missed some of the sustainability that's been going on in the last 12 to 18 months. But I do I do reckon there'll probably be a surge once the world well, is more predictable. I mean we've only got about three minutes left, but just kind of generally summing up which I like all three of you to, to do. But you know as an overview and, and, and understanding, I'm sorry about the connectivity. It's appalling and I'm really apologetic. But you know with with immigration and we've got the G seven um you know talking. Um Vaccine passports, I think that's the way forward. Uh, you know, that's also in pleasure as well as business. Um, Julia, do you think this is going to be something that corporates have to actually uh, make this mandate for people to, you know, travel if they if, if they have to have, you know, to travel um, so they've got their, their vaccines? Can you see that that's going to be compulsory to workforces? Um, I think that vaccine passports definitely will be the way forward. But I, I obviously there's some industries like hospitals and yeah. you know healthcare where where they they will make it and are making it mandatory. But I I think across the board that would be quite difficult to do. Mm -hmm. And um, you know there will always be alternatives to the to the vaccine passports so that people can still travel. It'll just be you know it might be slightly easier if you if you have easy proof of two vaccinations but there'll always be you know other exemptions and and ability what, what do you see is the biggest challenge to uh travel or yeah, to, to travel yeah to travel yes i think the biggest travel as wendy said is the is the uncertainty yeah. you know, i think that the numbers of covid cases they move very very fast and we only need to look at what's happened with the uk and portugal um right. and, you know it's caused a lot of uh, heartache for people who only a few weeks ago were told that they could go and now they're actually coming back spending all this money on mm. uh, you know uh, pcr tests etc and, you know, in, in, it's not the government's fault in lots of ways. They're just taking the data. But it just shows you how things move con so quickly and it, it does put people off uh, mm. traveling and, and people are very reluctant to get stuck anywhere. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Julia. And, and with you, Avron, I think, you know, as a, as a provider of mobility services, probably one of your business, uh, sorry, one of your ch- challenges in this last year is advising your clients being compliant and the risks in, in the various different types of um, assignments. But to just sum it up how, how you kind of have dealt with this last year. Ridden the roller coaster, <laughs> like all of us, I guess. We've all ridden. And we've all ridden that. Exactly, absolutely, and, and you know we're all here to talk about it. So thankfully, we, we obviously didn't didn't actually fall out of the darn thing, um, either on the way up or the way down. Um, <clears throat> no, look, I mean, I think basically, in summary, I, given that we've been talking about, it's been it's, uh, in the closing minutes, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to share the platform here with Wendy and Louise and 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 and. Um, Julia, um, you know, talking about mobility, immigration, and business travel, myths and reality post pandemic. We are at this point, I mean, depending on where you live on the globe, we are now eight, anywhere between 15 to 18 months into this thing, right? We here yeah. in APAC have been living a little longer than you guys, but you know, that's really not a badge of honor, I want to tell you. But so, you know, so, so, so 15 to 18 months in, um, I think we've learned a lot. I think I'm, I'm, I'm amazed by the resilience of colleagues and co-workers in, 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 our, in our respective industries. I'm amazed by the resilience um, and, and, and fortitude of uh, the people we work with and the companies whose, you know, whose talents and individuals and families who've actually moved under myriad trying circumstances and, and incredibly uh, you know, complicated and, 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 and challenging times. I think we're at that point where one of the biggest things we need to watch out for now as individuals, as companies, and it doesn't matter whether you're on the service provider side or on the, or on the corporate side, you know, in the world of business, um, I, I think the phenomenon of COVID exhaustion is real. I think yeah. there is real prevalent exhaustion uh, at many levels with COVID as a, as a you know, uh, determining factor in life. Um, we are hugely emboldened. I think we're well, not emboldened. I, I think we. One of the huge positives is to see finally some real, real progress in a significant economy, you know, like the U.S. and the significant strides made in the U.K. to vaccinate substantial numbers of people, which is ultimately the only way we're ever going to get out of this thing. Really, bottom line. I mean, we all know that. Um, and I think that at this stage. Uh, individually, collectively, as individual countries or regions, and just as a planet, we need to just not let our guard down and be aware, stay vigilant. Um, there's no opportunity to relax. Um, you know, and this thing is not is not beat yet. Um, and I think ultimately, I think we need to be remain vigilant and avoid declaring victory too soon, because even a country, you know, to me, Taiwan is the most salutary example. It had a absolutely almost near flawless um, 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 reputation throughout much of the you know first 80, 90 percent of COVID, and just very recently, out of nowhere, lost control, and it's really, really, really you know it's it's really biting hard and deep. So ultimately, I think you know um, to me that's the most important thing: uh, remain vigilant and avoid declaring victory too soon. Yeah, totally agree. Thank you, Avron, and and. Uh, Literally 30 seconds, I'm afraid, um, Wendy. Wendy, you're on mute, darling. <laughs> 30 seconds. I mean, so, no, I, I, would, I would agree that we, we um, I think, as, as travelling industry, I think we're still looking probably this time next year before we see, you know, a recovery or some. We can say it's a, becoming to be a recovery. Um, I know hospita- hospitality industry hasn't just been sitting and waiting. Um, they've obviously been looking at uh, their plans for enlarging and re- recruitment and um, looking at refurbishing their hotels. Um, and I'm sure we all can't wait for, uh, for us to be able to get life seeming like it's slightly normal to what it was before. And Julia, Julia, take us to the close because I think we just lost Louise one more time. Oh no, she's back. I'm back. back. I'm back. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. God. So, Go, we're good. Well, to be honest, um, I'm just so apologetic, but 
you know, just summing up really what I've learned from this amazing, com- you know, panel from all three of you. Yeah, well, immigration we need and it's probably going to be more compliant and uh, we've all got to have vaccines. And Julia, you're an absolute expert in that. Um, honestly, the, the different types of um assignments you've all got to be creative but it, there's a huge amounts of risk and compliance and you know you've got to identify it so there's lots of new rule books that have probably been rewritten and tax and um and recruitment well my recruitment days are all remote and now i have to manage people remotely on the cultural side lucky enough i i was able to meet most of my clients and and have a good understanding the type of people and the type of environment they work and it's educating them but this globe has definitely changed there'll never be the the old norm the new norm i think is exciting and us old people we do have to actually adapt to it i think the younger generation are more adaptable but i find it exciting but i really appreciate you know really thank you all for for joining this um this uh discussion on immigration um global mobility um business travel the myths and reality of it all thank you thank you very much louise brilliantly well, chaired. not really but uh, thank, you, thank you for your words thank you very much take care, care. bye bye